a few kind of introductory remarks before I start. Um, I'm going to read out a lecture. I'm going to illustrate it with PowerPoint. It might seem as if it's quite theory heavy, um, but actually I don't think it is. Uh, uh, there, are still, there are certainly some ideas in there, but uh, what, what I've done is to try to reduce the technical terms to a minimum. Um, my reason for that is, in general, I think if something... If I'm, t I'm, I'm talking about everyday, everyday life, everyday issues, and if everyday issues can't be talked about in everyday language, there has to be something wrong. So I've tried to use everyday language as much as I can. Inevitably, there are some te technical terms and specialist terms that I've included, but I've, I've, I'm explaining them, I think. Um, the ideas all hinge around the same question. And the question is, what does it mean to be human and what are we capable of? And I'm looking at this question from a number of different directions. First of all, I'm looking at it from the direction of what six existential philosophers said. And after the break, in terms of seven themes of everyday life. So because it's the same question, what does it mean to be human and what are we capable of? This is what I'm talking about all the time. So at any point, if you're thinking, what's he on about now? Just remember that question. Uh, what I'm on about is some dimension of what does it mean to be human and what, what are we capable of. Um, about the question, se the question section at the end, I'm sure there will be questions, well, but what, what I'd quite like to happen, I know it kind of conspires against it because you're in row rows and you're all looking this way, what I'd quite like to happen, as well as questions, is to hear what personal responses you have to the material. So it doesn't have to be a question. You it could say, I felt like this when I was listening to that. That's, that's fine. It doesn't have to be a question that you're asking me. Or if it is a question you're asking me, you're not, you don't feel you have to ask me. If somebody else wants, has a response to that question, that'd be great as well. Okay. Um, you probably noticed that although the, the title of the whole day, today, whole day today includes the word potential, the title of my talk does not. So what's going on? Well, the words we use are important. Language is never neutral or objective. It always represents a particular point of view. Words have echoes and resonances that influence the meanings we take from them. Potential is one such. As a way of referring to what human beings are capable of, <coughs> the term potential is relatively recent, <coughs> but also arose in a particular culture at a particular time. It came out of the mid-20th century work of people like Alfred Adler, Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers that formed and continues to be the basis of the humanistic psychology movement. All new ideas develop dialectically in response to pre-existing ones, and the humanistic psychology movement developed in opposition to both behaviorism and psychoanalysis. For a while, it was known as the third force. The problem it had with both of these was that they were both in different ways rooted in determinism. They aspired to objectivity. In contrast, humanistic psychology valued subjectivity. For its first 20 years, humanistic psychology was a minor academic discipline, but as a result of the social and cultural changes principally, though not exclusively, in the US. In the late 60s, it broke out of academia as the human potential movement. It suggested that people were capable of far more than was expected of them, and that influences, largely social influences, maintained this lack of achievement. Therapeutic strategies like encounter groups based on catharsis were developed to release this potential. Underpinning it all was a belief that people, if people could access their potential, they would be happier, more creative, more fulfilled, and that would bring about positive social change. Culturally, it's not difficult to see the humanistic, to see humanistic psychology and the human potential movement as a phenomenon that embodied post-Second World War North American values. The word I've used in my title 
is development. But this also has associations. There are biological terms like instinct, maturing, ripening, growth, evolving, and of course, development itself. There are 19th century mechanistic hydraulic terms. People talked and still talk of running out of steam, letting it out and releasing emotion. Implicit in these is another hydraulic metaphor, that of blockage. Most, much psychotherapy still draws on this metaphor, believing catharsis, removal of the blockage caused by some event in the past, to be central to the notion of change. There are 20th century technological terms like making, transforming, changing, building, usually associated with the words the self. The most obvious flaw in this is that, is that to maximize potential from a machine, you just run it for longer. If you run humans for longer, output goes down. Much human misery is because people are treated like machines. Using computer-derived terms, we see the, the brain as an inf information processor of memories being stored in the brain and recovered as if the brain was a hard drive and of the need to be reprogrammed or restarted. The contemporary enthusiasm for neuroscience is similar in that it sees the brain as a complex biological machine that runs algorithms on sets of data. In contrast, the narrative tradition sees identity as being re-hyphen-membered, re-membered, put back together again in a different way every time it's told. There is no correct memory to be found. There is only a story currently being lived. The word potential chimes in nicely with humanistic ethics, but as we shall see, existentialists are rather more concerned with the impact of time in the wider human context, and that's why, regardless of its shortcomings, I prefer the word development, because it does at least imply something happening over time. So what about the word existential? There are three principles that a body of knowledge needs to go along with to be described as an existential body of knowledge. The first is that existence precedes essence. This comes from a quote by Sartre from 1946. He says, what do we mean by saying that ex existence precedes essence? We mean that man first of all exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world and defines himself afterwards. This means that certain facts of our existence, like our genetic makeup, family circumstances, gender, race, culture, as well as the fact that we were born in the first place, are imposed upon us without any choice. We have no pre-established purpose or nature, nor anything that we have to be or ought to be. On our path through life from birth to death, we start with something we have not requested, our individual existence, and our life task is to make it into something personal and owned, only to lose it when we die. Existentialists describe this as absurd, and the most basic challenge of life is to find a way to live with this and discover ways of being that get us what we decide we need, bearing in mind that what we need changes as we go through life. Our awareness of this leads to the second principle, personal responsibility. What we come to think of as our essence, our self, is a result of the way we choose to meet the givens of our personal existence. Existentialists prefer to use the phrase sense of self, and the hyphens are important because they reinforce the primacy of experience. experience. And secondly, that the self as something to find, to enact, is an artifact of natural science. When we understand this, we understand about the consequences of our actions and the meaning of our unfolding lives, and we can choose whether to be the active creator of our own life or the passive recipient of a life. This is how we find out about the world, by engaging with it. The legal right to freedom of speech still leaves us with the existential question of finding something to say that we believe in and the need to take responsibility for what happens next. We're obviously not free to, do to be anything we like. We're constrained by circumstance and context, 
what existentialists call facticity. But our stance to this is ours and ours alone. We only see ourselves as fixed because it invo evokes too much anxiety, existential anxiety, to acknowledge that we are the product of our choices and actions. Because this responsibility is hard to accept, we tend to evade and deny it. We close down our possibilities, our potential, imagining that our life will become easier and simpler, and in a sense it does, except it also becomes narrower and more rigid. The paradox of freedom is that we have to live as if there's certainty while knowing that there is none. And the dilemma is that we have to make our choices with no guarantee of success. This is the existential nature of our freedom. The third principle is about how the theory is arrived at. Any investigation needs a research method that matches what is being investigated. The natural scientific method, which assumes objectivity, works very well with inanimate objects, which have a fixed nature. A chair is always a chair. It can never decide not to be a chair. Prototype Natural science research questions are what is the essential nature of and what is the cause of? It has given us many stage theories of human development. It, but it doesn't work so well with people because we are responsive to context. We are free to choose. In the early 20th century, phenomenology was devised as a research method more appropriate for the human sciences. Phenomenology is the study of experience. It investigates the relationship between the objective and the subjective. It therefore assumes that we are not just passive observers, we are active interpreters of our meaning world. The prototype phenomenological research question is, what is it like when? And the data gathered is therefore experience near. But as the researcher is part of the research, as a safeguard against the researcher finding what they want to find, they have to examine their own assumptions. The relationship between phenomenology and existentialism is that existentialism, existentialism is the body of knowledge that arises when the research method of phenomenology is applied to the study of existence. The cultural dominance of natural science has led to its assumptions being embedded not only in the theories, but in the cultural discourse about human development. Stages are taken as being fact when they're an artifact of the research method. Although some elements of stage theories undoubtedly have some resonance with everyday life, they are unable to account for the very qualities of the most distinctive of human life the ability to choose, to hope, and to love, and the need to li live with meaning and purpose. When phenomenolo phenomenology is used as a research method to look at human development, human potential, it comes with, up with something radically different from the stage theory. The model revealed is that life is a continuous, proce is, is a continuous process based on the acquisition of the skills of living in the context of the paradoxes and dilemmas of existence. It is about how we make choices about the future and how we choose to explore our potentialities. The question that then arises is not what are the stages of, the development, of development, but how do we get from birth when the dilemmas and paradoxes of existence are not understood to existential maturity and wisdom which is by no means guaranteed anyway, when they are understood. This has been referred to by R.D. Lang in the following way, in The Divided Self. It's interesting, this paragraph, because almost everybody I, I talk to has read the, the Divided Self, but almost nobody remembers this paragraph. He says, Biological birth is a definitive act whereby the infant organism is precipitated into the world. Under usual circumstances, the physical birth of the new living organism into the world inaugurates rapidly ongoing processes whereby the infant feels real and alive and has a sense of being an entity with continuity in time and a location in space. In short, physical birth and biological aliveness are followed by the baby becoming existentially born as real and alive. 
having, having laid the foundations now, I'm going to move on to looking in more detail at what the major existential philosophers have said about, about, becoming, about what ex becoming existentially born might mean. Having said that, I'll only be giving you the bare bones of what, what they said. The project I set myself because of the time and the t time limit is, is that I had to shrink down everything that these philosophers had said to about 800 words. So I, I've obviously missed out some of the detail. I'm going to start with Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard is often called the father of mo modern existentialism, and one reason for this is that he actively linked his life with his philosophy. For him, <clears throat> for him as for all existentialists, Philosophy is not just some interesting thoughts about life, it's a description about how living is done. For Kierkegaard, accessing our potential is about finding the best way to live. He says, the crucial thing <clears throat> is to find a truth which is truth for me, to find the idea for which I'm willing to live and die. Note the and in live and die, not just something to die for, but also something to live for. His prompt for this was the way he saw that 19th century Danish bourgeois society, and particularly the Lutheran church, both reinforced conformity and undermined Christianity. As a consequence, he said, people had lost their capacity for personal questioning, for finding their own truth. So how does he get to this? For Kierkegaard, human development is not biological. It's a spiritual process of continual becoming which means by reflecting on being. Movement through it, though, is by no means automatic. There are three parts to his model of spiritual development. The first is the aesthetic way. For Kierkegaard, our development starts in childhood when we are unaware of the meaning of and possibilities offered by freedom. Childhood is led by the immediacy of sensation, and there is little reflection on being. As said, movement is not automatic. Some people stay in spiritual childhood forever. Sooner or later, we start asking about the meaning of freedom, and then we have a choice to make, deny it or own it. If we deny it, we pursue sensation not for its own sake, but to hide our lack of direction. It then becomes a cover for despair. Kierkegaard says there are many ways of doing this. At one end of, of a continuum is addiction. At the other end is a way of life chosen because it involves no personal challenge. In adults, certain sorts of denial are often described wrongly as living life to the full, when the person is actually evading life to the full. But owning it means we have to find another, more meaningful way to live. And we move to the ethical way. We begin this by abandoning our reliance on the transient ple pleasures of the outer world and by turning towards our inner world. We start to consider, for perhaps the first time, the effect our actions have both on ourselves and on others. And in doing so, we start for the first time to choose a set of values to live by. We start looking towards convention as a guide. Initially, however, leaving behind the world of sens sensation may seem too high a price to pay. Convention looks, just looks too boring. In such cases, Kierkegaard would say that we are not despairing enough. Using the example of addiction, things have just not got bad enough. Rock bottom has not been reached. Although the choice will be seen as an either-or, because of the dialectical nature of change, the aesthetic and the ethical are not automatically in opposition to each other. But this will not be understood because the transition cannot be made with reason, with guarantees. We have to risk. Sooner or later, though, convention having been chosen, what was once thought to be absolute is found to be relative. And because of this, there is a growing realization that convention is no defense against despair. We discover that successful socialization does not lead to a contented life. We start to approach the religious way. 
when we realize that despair cannot ever be avoided and has to be met with faith. In faith, we discover the paradox that the only truths that, can, that really matter are the truths that cannot be known. The sort of faith Kierkegaard talks about is a faith in life itself, and this is how he, def he defines God. Every person has to discover, make and choose God for him or herself in every action. A fairly everyday example of faith is the choice many people make about who to live with, who to marry. The rational absurdity of this decision can be put in this way. What makes you think that having known this person for six months that he or she will make, make you happy till death us do part? The answer, of course, is that you don't know. You either commit to faith and continual change, or you retreat to convention or sensation and commit to staying the same. So we move to Nietzsche. Nietzsche's question is essentially the same as Kierkegaard's, which is how to be an individual, how to preserve our autonomy in the face of the normalizing effects of society and religion. But he came to a very different conclusion. He is perhaps best known for the phrase, God is dead. He says, we have killed him, you and I, all of us are his murders, murderers, God is dead. What he meant was that science had destroyed the Christian value system of European society, leaving a Christian style ethical system devoid of spirituality. This has been described by critics as nihilistic and therefore an endpoint. For Nietzsche, though, it was a beginning because it offered humanity an opportunity for spiritual transformation it had never had. He was also highly critical of Christianity itself. He saw it as a fundamentally malign influence because it focuses on the afterlife and the weak. By denigrating human power and mystifying weakness into strength, it results in a culture in which people are praised for the amount of suffering they can endure. He called this slave morality. He sees victimhood as an achievement and litigation and public shaming as a legitimate way of establishing blame, exacting revenge and becoming famous, but not from any personal effort. Underneath it is a problematic relationship with power in which fearful of being held responsible for someone else's misfortune, we become risk averse and retreat into conformity. While it's supposed to make life safer, safer, it actually makes us spiritually dead. This is the, con the contentment of what he called the herd, for which similarity to others is an end point. Nietzsche describes such qualities as the, sp as the spiritual complacency of the last man, and he would recognize its symptoms in our contemporary world, where options masquerade as choices, where sex is a commodity, where art is a product to be bought and sold, and where political and ethical, de ethical debate is dominated by lies and accusations of fear-mongering, which then, not surprisingly, degenerate into personal attacks. The contemporary populist rhetoric of freedom and of taking back control clearly has great leverage in a culture based on slave morality, because the freedom being offered is a bogus freedom from them that we are alleged to be under attack, under attack from. In this argument, we, the people, are asked to place our trust, our power, in a charismatic leader who promises to return the power to us, but actually intends it to use it for his own purposes. We can take some satisfaction from knowing that history has never been kind to such people. As Nietzsche would say, do not trust anyone who says, trust me. <laughs> for Nietzsche, life is struggle. And the power of the human spirit was discovered through struggle. And that paradoxically, it is through struggle that we discover our potential. He has no time for complacency. He wanted to keep on asking, uh, he wanted to keep us, keep on asking the, uh, he wanted us to keep on asking the deeply moral question of how we should live and what the point of our lives is. But he was not against compassion. But it had to be derived from the knowledge that all people share the same struggles, not from a delusion of superiority on the part of the carer. This is pity, 
and will only make the weak more powerless because it reinforces slave morality. In struggling, the spirit undergoes three transformations, the culmination of which is becoming the ubermensch, the overman. And like Kierkegaard's, transformation is in no way automatic. The starting point is in childhood. He uses the metaphor of a camel whose task is to take on loads without reflecting on its personal meaning. Sooner or later, though, taking on loads becomes too easy and it needs the challenge of not taking on loads. The transformation of the cam camel spirit to the lion spirit represents how we assert our fundamental independence by rejecting the loads we've taken on, but again, without much self-reflection. Again, as before, destructiveness becomes just too easy and on abandoning it, the proactive child spirit emerges. He says, the child is innocence and forgetting, a new beginning, a game, a wheel rolling out of itself, a first movement, a sacred yes saying. It's important to remember that when he uses the word child, he doesn't use it chronologically, he uses it spiritually. Having faced nihilism with courage and survived, the spirit is now free to act on its own power and say yes to life. He also considered the experiential nature of time in his theory of eternal recurrence. Consistent with a culture of endemic passivity, it's tempting to think of change as happening to us and, as t and time as being outside us. But procrastinating and waiting for the right moment we deny and then lose the ability to use our own power. His idea of eternal recurrence is associated with a proposition that our fear of death is derived from our fear of an unlived life. He says, what if some day or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more and there will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. Paraphrased, he suggests that if we're, if we're able to look at ourselves and answer honestly that we have not ducked any of the challenges life has thrown at us, and that we'll be happy for all the events of our lives to be repeated in exactly the same way, for eternity, then we are truly living authentically. And the Ubermensch has been achieved, but only up to that moment. Either way, there is always more work to do. This is relevant not just to living, but also to dying. As he says, if we are able to live at the right time, we are able to recognize opportunity. Then we are able also to die at the right time, not too early and not too late. Mention of death brings us to Martin Heidegger. He was also preoccupied with our experience of time. For Heidegger, time is not something we have, it is what we are. We are temporal. He begins his major work like this. For manifestly, you have long been aware of what you mean when you use the expression being. We, however, who used to think we understood it, have now become perplexed. He's asking, what exactly do we mean by being? What does it mean to be alive in time and in the world? He uses the phrase being in the world. And the hyphens are important as it indicates our sense of permanent connection with all that is, all that was, and all that will be. The world matters to us. But knowing this means that I also know that I will, at some future time, cease to exist. He uses the word authenticity to refer to this awareness, this mode of being. Existentially, authenticity does not refer to what is real or genuine, nor can it be standardized or normalized. These terms are only valid in a natural scientific sense. It's often used by the humanistic tradition in this sense. The clue to it, its existential meaning is in the first four letters, auth, 
as in authorship, ownership. It's about our ability to fully grasp our temporal nature and the responsibility have, we have for ourselves and also for others in our world, for they are functionally inseparable. But it's not sustainable because it invokes anxiety. I've used that, I put, used that with a capital A because this is a, anxiety as he uses it is a technical term, meaning anxiety of being. It doesn't refer to everyday anxiety of stress, agitation. He's still talking about it in a philosophical sense. But this can only be tolerated for a short time before we distract ourselves with more everyday concerns and then we slip into inauthenticity. In inauthenticity, we attempt to deny anxiety and distance ourselves from our temporality. But by doing this, we also deny possibility, deny potential, and we always know this. This is existential guilt. A characteristic of inauthentic living is that we see ourselves as being caused and that life is a technical problem to be solved. It's actually more accurate to talk about the single idea of authenticity, inauthenticity, since each has the seeds of the other, and we are, we are always in a state of flux between the two. As said, the world matters to us. So what did he say about the world that we're a part of? In the human world, the way we are with other people affects how much we can own the responsibility we have for our own lives. This has a direct bearing on our potential. He contrasts two different ways of being with others, one which tends to limit our openness to the world and one which tends to constrain our openness to the world, to others. The first is a way that respects the autonomy of the other person at the same time as respecting our own and it gives rise to a mutually, mutual opening to being and our potential is increased and we feel better. The second is a way of it that involves directing the other person overtly or covertly such that neither person's autonomy is respected and it gives rise to a mutual closing to being. It makes our potential it, it decreases our potential and we feel worse. In the material world, his concern with technology was about how our relationship with it changes our way of being. He again contrasts two way of, ways of being. The first is that we get to understand the world by using tools such that they become as if part of us. We become more hands-on and the skills we gain are transferable and our potential is increased and we feel better. Another way is by seeing the world technologically, we become alienated from our existence. Even though we may use objects, how can we not? Our relationship with them is, is the, through non-transferable and specific techniques and at arm's length, so to speak. Potential is decreased and we feel worse. Jean-Paul Sartre came to prominence in the years after the, the end of the Second World War, at the same time that humanistic psychology began to emerge in the US. The US clearly had a different experience of World War II than Europe. While Sartre shared Heidegger's starting point that we're thrown into existence, he, he had read Being and Time when he was a prisoner of war. He, he did not share Heidegger's conclusion that temporality was its central organizing principle. Instead, he prioritized freedom. Since we come into being as a blank slate with no pre-established purpose or nature, we are free to make ourselves within the limits of our facticity. This freedom is tied up with responsibility because he meant that we have responsibility for our lives, whether we like it or not. This is the only choice we do not have. Even not making a choice is a choice. This is what he meant when he said, to be is to be, contempt, to be <coughs> condemned to be free. Existentially, choice has nothing to do with selection between options. It's to do with commitment 
to a course of action, to a project, to a cause. In his case, a political cause, but it could have been anything. It's up to us. This is the fundamental dilemma of existence, and it continues till death, because with death comes loss of freedom, loss of potential. The degree to which we deny our fundamental freedom and assert that we have been determined, either by nature or by nurture, is a measure of how much we are in bad faith, which is roughly comparable to Heidegger's inauthenticity. Both nature and nurture are givens. It's up to us to choose our response to them. Because of our need to be able to say, this is who I am, we start very early to make sense of the world based on how we feel we are regarded by, want to be regarded by, or want to regard the others in our world. The pattern that countless similar choices come to form, Sartre recalls our original project of how to be in the world. And all our subsequent life projects are based on this original project. What we come to call our personality, our sense of self, is a result of these choices and actions, and although made at a particular time and place, it is then expected to last for all time. Like a self-fulfilling prophecy, we search out opportunities that coincide with our original project and reject those that don't. From time to time, we say, that's the story of my life, without realizing that we've written the story ourselves. We are at any, every moment, the sum total of our choices and actions. In this way, our potential reduces, or rather, we reduce our own potential. But we always have an ambivalent attitude to our original project. On the one hand, we believe it to be accurate and coherent. We say, this is the way I am. But on the other hand, we have a nagging sense that there's nothing fixed about it at all. Maybe my life could have been entirely different if only I'd made different choices. Although potentially disruptive, the ability to ask what if is actually a source of hope. Without it, life would literally be hopeless because there would be no future to have hopes for and we would be losing out on our potential. As if this were not tricky enough already, we're also intensely aware not just that other people are also free to do whatever they want, but also that we are just more alive when we engage with our own and others' freedom and when we cooperate. When we trust ourselves, when we trust others, we discover our potentiality. When we see ourselves as fixed, we die existentially and lose our potentiality. I don't know how many people have heard of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, but he is at least as important as all the others. Although lesser known than Sartre, Merleau-Ponty and Sartre were intellectual equals who influenced each other both philosophically and politically. He was primarily a phenomenologist. He says, Reflection does not withdraw from the world. It steps back to watch the forms of transcendence fly up like sparks from a fly fire. It slackens the intentional threads which attach us to the world and thus brings them to our notice. I alone in is consciousness of the world because it reveals that, wo that world as strange and paradoxical. And his focus was on the body, or rather on embodiment, and on the nature of perception. Perception is not simply visual, it's how we make sense of the world, and it's always both from the body and in terms of the body. And as the distinction between the mind and the body is a product of natural science, it's phenomenologically consistent to talk about a single mind-body system. We are embodied. While the boundary of our physical body is fixed, the boundary of our of my imagined body is not. We know this when we sit next to someone or when we drive a car. It refers to the sense that I know the boundaries of the car as I know the boundaries of myself. We say, get out of my space or come into my space. <coughs> but more than this, we are not cut off from the world. We are perm permanently connected to the world. This is not objective or subjective or objective and subjective. It is intersubjective. The two are entwined, 
functionally inseparable. It's the footnote to this. A lot of people use the word outside of the existential arena. A lot of people use the word intersubjective. Um, it, it's taken on different meanings, and the people who use it often don't realise where the what the original meaning comes from. It's from Merleau-Ponty. Phenomenologically, we're all intersubjectively connected bodies in space, permanently enclosing and being enclosed by and finding meaning in the world. For Merleau-Ponty, childhood was a serious philosophical issue. He felt it was the job of philosophy not just to find out what is, but also how it came to be so. A major turning point in childhood is when a child understands that it sees itself in a mirror not someone else. All of a sudden, the world becomes a different place. It's the beginning of being able to see oneself as if from the outside, objectively, as well as from the inside, subjectively. Moreover, just as I see others as different and separate, so others must see me as different and separate. I am just one person in the world of people. This is one of the first of what he calls decentering experiences. And it refers to the experience of realizing that the world and my relationship to it is not what I thought it was. He uses the parallel term recentering to describe the way we restore our relationship with the world. But it will never be restored to what it was. We can never go back. Recentering also brings in a sense of spatial and temporal change, that what was is no more. In cases where recentering is resisted, temporal change is also denied. It would be as if time, development, has stopped at that point. Potential ceases. The initial decentering and recentering of existence mediated by the mirror is only the first of many because life, in fact, is constant decentering and recentering. And this relates to what we can call narcissism. Phenomenologically, narcissism is the refusal to accept that one's current view is only one view and that one is not the center of the universe and is the assertion that others must support this viewpoint. When others do not, it is felt as a massive decentering. In most cases, the child will be cared for with the sensitivity that is his right. And th if this happens, the child will be able to tolerate occasional unreliability and random acts of freedom and conclude that other people are generally trustworthy. Empathy, the understanding of difference, is a consequence of this. In this way, the ambiguity of relationships with others comes to be trusted and the child grows up not to be afraid of freedom. But if the child experiences constant, consistent unreliability and insensitivity, development will take another course into what we can call narcissism. The randomness and freedom of the world, which would otherwise the experienced as exciting is felt to be frightening and is closed down from. This is always defensive and always constrains the potential of the person and all those he or she encounters. Last but not least, Simone de Beauvoir. She's best known for her relationship with Sartre and her contribution to feminism, but she is so much more than this. She felt strongly that philosophy should not be abstract. It is the way we think, feel, and act from moment to moment between birth and death. It's the way we live. This is why she wrote her autobiographies. At the center of her life's work were the meaning of freedom, and from childhood she became intensely aware of her freedom through her lack of it. She says about her childhood, among my pieces of good fortune, I count the fact that my parents' different views on morality drove me into consternation. I made up my mind to be answerable to myself alone. For her, freedom was always both existential and situational. Existential because it's a fundamental human quality. We are born with it and never without it. And situational 
because there can be no equality between individuals if there is inequality in society. This is the meaning of the, the, the statement, the personal is, the, is political. For Beauvoir, the object of life is to facil facilitate the growth of freedom through our commitment to our personal projects, which always involve relationships with other people. We move from a position at birth, when we live, live our freedom and do not understand it, to a position of what we can call existential maturity, which we, where we do understand it and are able to use it ethically. This is how we discover our potential. Her best work, her best known work though, is The Second Sex. She opens the second part with the now well-known, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. By talking phenomenologically rather than biologically about, about the body, she was able to consider gender as distinct from sex and talk about gender as being socially constructed, not biologically determined. The overarching myth she challenges is how women come to see themselves as defined to, defined by and, relate, and in relation to men. Although obviously focused on women's experience, her thesis is that identity based on biology is equally damaging to everyone. It limits the potential of both women and men. For freedom to be reclaimed, it's not a solution for women to try to become more like men or vice versa. This is just to reverse the mutually alienating and reductionist myth. One person's freedom and transcendence can never be achieved at the expense of another's. A work that is equally important, but has been given much less attention, is her work on ageing. And as with everything else, her reasons for writing it were personal. She wrote The Coming of Age, as when she felt herself getting old. When she was 55. As with gender, old age is biological and cultural, as well as existential, and while the biological and the cultural contribute to it, they do not determine it. It's existential because we experience meaning differently as we go through it. She says that the overarching myth of ageing is that adulthood is the norm and old people are different, and that this is reinforced by a culture that denies the significance of embodied temporality. The transition from adulthood to old age, therefore, has the potential to prompt us to approach the end of our days realistically, existentially realistically. This, however, is not automatic. It would depend largely on how much the person is prepared to question the myths of old age. When she first began to think about it in her late 40s, she saw only decline, loss of freedom and repetition. But later on, she began to see it rather differently. She says, there is only one solution if old age is not to be an absurd parody of our former life, and that is to go on pers pursuing ends that give our existence a meaning, devotion, devotion to individuals, to groups or to causes, social, political, intellectual or creative work. One's life has value so long as one contributes value to the life of others by means of love, friendship, indignation, compassion. Indignation may seem like a curious addition to this list, but it makes sense because a certain amount of dissatisfaction with the human world is necessary in order that we may generate projects that we hope will contribute to an increase in the sum total of human freedom, even if we are not around when they come to fruition. The alternative is passivity, despair and existential suicide. In this way, we fulfill our existential commitment to future generations. When she said, to will oneself free is also to will others free, she was not just talking about present known others, but also future unknown others. This is what she means by potential existentially. Okay, so having looked at what the philosophers have to say about human potential, it's obvious that they all have distinct ideas about the issues we face as we live between birth and death. But it's also apparent that there are considerable overlaps between them. 
They are, after all, talking about the same thing, you and me. Some of these overlaps are more obvious, some less, some more compatible with e each other, some less. Now, I'm a psychotherapist, and one of my purposes when looking at all this material is to think of its re relevance to psychotherapeutic practice. But there's actually nothing very special about psychotherapy. At its simplest, it's just two people in a room talking about the problems of living, trying to understand each other, and trying to maximize potential. Any differences between psychotherapy and everyday life are those of context rather than of content. Therefore, all the seven themes I'm going to talk about are relevant to everyday life. The first one I've called living with age and aging. We're born, we age, and then we die. This much is known, and, there's, and always in that order. And there's no doubt that people at different ages define their life issues in different ways. Aging is certainly biological, but it's also existential, because at every moment we're all trying to live with meaning and purpose as temporal beings. We're all familiar with the phrase age-appropriate behavior, and there are biological and socially constructed issues at play here. And on many occasions, it's difficult to tell them apart. But if we think of human development as a process of coming to understand the, the dilemmas and paradoxes of existence, this phrase begins to lose its meaning. What replaces it is the idea of person-appropriate behavior, because we're interested in individual meaning, not in establishing norms. When we do this, we begin not to think of categories like child and adult biologically, and hence linked to chronology, but existentially and linked to meaning making. In order to do this, we all need to reflect on what it means to be the age we are now, and what biases and prejudices we have about the different parts of life. Most writing on the life cycle, potential, development, is by adults, simply because they have the biological and economic power to do so. This gives an adult, middle-aged, and usually male-centered perspective. Looking from an adult point of view gives rise to the notion of three parts of life that are seen as being separate from each other only because of where they are viewed from. Childhood is viewed as having happened, with respect to childhood, the way we remember it is as a remembering adult. Young people often say that older people do not understand them, but those older have had the experience of being young, although they may forget its impact on them. We need to ask then, what has conspired to make some adults lose touch with their own experience of childhood? Whatever it is, it leads the temptation to standardize and objectify children by maturity, academic ability, medical diagnosis, and behavior, and so on. One obvious difference between children and adults is that adults have simply had longer to translate their original product into project into the so-called facts of their personality in order to avoid the anxiety of freedom and choice. A child is involved in this as much, if not more, than an adult. Adults believe they have done it, Children know they have not. Children have an immediacy of experience that is forgotten by adults. Maybe adults are afraid of children's flexibility, imagination, and passion. Adulthood is viewed as presently happening. It's hard to make any judgment about its significance or banality. We usually only find out later, sometimes much later, sometimes never. There is no perspective or way of looking at it based on distance in time to see how it is. Most of the time we think we know what's going on, but actually we don't. <coughs> Old age is view usually viewed from the perspective of an adulthood that has no direct experience of it. We do not know anything about the part of life to come, but we have to project ourselves into it. But this begs a question, when does old age begin? Underneath the usual answer, though, is what usually translates into everyday ageism. The answer is not yet. So what's this about? 
the old actually are hard to define. There's no legal definition. Age brings no cultural privileges, only exemption from societal obligation, and this leads to a gradual disenfranchisement. In the UK, one marker is having a bus pass, but this is not exclusive to chronologically old people and is also invisible. There is even ambiguity about how to refer to them. They are variously described as old, elderly, senior, pensioner, granny, usually pejoratively or patronizingly. Old people are complimented on how not old, how young they look. And this too translates into socially acceptable ageism. They are habitually viewed as homogeneous when in fact they are with the, an extraordinarily heterogeneous group spanning two generations, 40 years. Some old people are some of the fittest, richest, and most powerful in society, while some are the most decrepit, poorest, and powerless. Another issue is that retirement is the first time since childhood when people can decide what to do and when to do it, or not. This is a challenge. While it's true that in later life gains may be outweighed by losses, suggesting that ageing is a process of decay, decay or decline is neither a helpful way of viewing the final part of life, nor consistent with the experience of old people. Researchers have consistently found that at probably no other time of life is there as potent a force towards self-awareness operating as in old age. Existentialism challenges the assumption that ageing adults uh, aging equals loss, but we must also acknowledge that the counter myth that emphasizes the positive elements of getting old may be fueled by death denial. One way, of ca one way to counter this is for young people to get to know some older people. Existential change is always related to humility in the face of the unknown, and the experience of people older than oneself is always unknown. The next one I call living with truth, narrative, and the sense of self. Making and exchanging stories is a uniquely human activity, and the, the history of humanity is the history of storytelling from cave paintings of 40,000 years ago to the emergence of writing 6,000 years ago up to the way we use social media in the present day. Telling and listening to stories is how we relate to each other and how we gain a sense of self. They are how we write our autobiography. Telling stories, if only to ourselves, enables us to reflect on past choices and future possibilities and our place between the two. And in this way, our sense of self is tied up with our temporality and wondering whether we are achieving our potential. In this way, questions, why me, why this, why now, and why here, take on an important, an enormous importance and relevance. But there are paradoxes at the heart of making an autobiography. And one is that we always know that our knowledge is partial Reality is ambiguous and our story can only be up to the present day. Another is that we gain a resilient and coherent sense of self because of, and not in spite of, our ability to be different in different circumstances by being open to change. From the moment of birth, parents and babies are telling each other stories about what it's like to be in each other's company. And in this way, both start becoming existentially born. Research has shown that life stories change with age. By about two or three, children can tell and share stories and like having stories read to them. And adolescence is, also, is the time of personal diary writing. Also, peers become more significant for adolescence as people, tell, as people to tell stories to. Also in adolescence, temporality opens out in a much more personal way than, it, than before to include not just the past and the present, but also the future. Questions like, how did I get here? What right have you got to tell me what to do? And what am I going to do now? Become more important. Temporality brings thoughts not only of death, but also responsibility for life. 
It's easy to imagine that well-being depends on the search for the key memory and its correct interpretation. If only I could find out what really happened and what it meant, then my life would be okay, we think. This is a, a natural scientific historical version of truth. Existentially, though, we will never find out what really happened or what it meant. We will never really know why people did whatever they did. What we can do is find out what it means for us now and how satisfied we are with this construction. Paradoxically, when we accept the facticity of the past, we also own the responsibility to change the meaning we attach to it. We discover possibility, potential. Well-being does not depend on the search for the key memory and its correct interpretation, rather than a fluid dialectic between story-making and story-breaking. Achieving our potential is about being able to update autobiography in line with current experience and realizing that for as long as we are alive, there is no guarantee that the current meaning will last beyond the present moment. The idea of transformational moments and episodes is embedded in all cultures in terms of the formal rituals that we use to mark the ending of one way of being and the beginning of another. Birthdays, the distance from the day, date we were thrown into the world, those birthdays with a zero at the end seem to have a special meaning. Can I really be 10 years older? New year with an expectation of resolutions to make the next year different from the last. The first day at school, symbolic of a separation from parents and the ability to have secrets and to know things that parents do not. Leaving home, independence, religious ceremonies symbolizing the time when the person is deemed capable of faith. Graduation, the first sexual experience, engagement, marriage, parenthood, midlife, funerals, retirement, death of a parent, birth of grandchildren, death of a contemporary, death of someone younger, etc., etc. And anniversaries of all these. They are how we mark our lives and all lead us to reflect on our temporality. Some of them we prepare for and look forward to, others we don't. At the right time, they will, in Lang's words, enhance the feeling of being real and alive. At the wrong time, they will fracture this sense. By being alert to their resonance and allowing, acknowledging what such landmarks mean to us, we can tap into our potential. Each echo is different because it happens at a different time. <clears throat> the next one, third one, I call living with beginnings and endings. A common mistake when considering beginnings and endings is to see them as events rather than as processes. Moreover, they are just different ways of looking at the same process, life. When we realize this, we realize that everything in life is beginning and ending simultaneously. And it also involves both gains and losses. Rather than being in opposition to each other, they are dialectically connected. We can call the sense of beginnings natality and that of endings mortality. Natality reminds us that everything starts, everything at least has the potential of being different from what was. It's a reminder of the new, the free, or pure potential. Our wonder at the fragility and smallness of, for example, a baby's fingernails is not simply because they are small. It's because the baby represents potential, that a completely new being has arisen out of nothing, and of what may become of it. There's a fantasy within natality that some sort of completeness of potential may occur. Compare this with what it's like to hold the hand of someone very old, whose hands show all the signs and scars of living. In natality, there's a mixture of hope and anticipation of potential that's also tinged with sadness and melancholy because we know that it will fade. Mortality reminds us that we only have a short time to decide what to do, find out how to do it, and then do it. It reminds us that everything is transient, everything finishes. It's a reminder of the winding down and the eventual expiring of potential. 
while it too is often tinged with sadness and melancholy, people don't like to be reminded of it. But can also, it, it can also be tinged with hope and anticipation that what has been done has made a difference. In a full realization of mortality, the realization that not only did completeness never happen, but it was never going to happen anyway. And that this is not just unfortunate or a personal failing, although it may be on some level, it is necessary that the next generation try for completeness and fail. Young, younger people tend to be a preoccupied by newness and potential, and tend not to be bothered by things ending. There's plenty of time for everything. Transience is fine. Old, older people tend to be concerned with maintaining things as they are, or even trying to return things to the way they were. This helps to stop the awareness of time passing, and hence awareness of mortality. To concentrate on mortality is to concentrate on the transformation of the human into the material. The other side of the equation, which precedes it, is the transformation of the material into the human. The overriding mystery of existence is how it is that the material can transform into the human and back to the material at all. But there's a paradox and a dilemma at the center of death. The paradox is that although physical death will kill me, the denial of, of death will destroy the time I have left. Well, the, the idea of death will save me in the sense that it will prompt me to live my life more resourcefully. Fear of death is not so much about the fear that life will end, it's about a fear that not enough has been done in life. The question that it asks is, how can I live my life fully while knowing I may die at any moment? We all want to be remembered, to have made a difference, but try as we might, we cannot control this from beyond the grave. But we need to have the humility to realize that the way we will be remembered is beyond our control. The, but the more authentically we live, the more chance there will be that we will be remembered as having been a good influence. Our personal history of endings uh, at least has the potential of teaching us what makes life actually worth living. This is a key lesson, because when we learn that, we can also learn when life is no longer worth living, and then we can die, as Nietzsche said, happy. Given that endings are universally difficult and frequently avoided, often the way we remember something, it, uh, its way will be, will, its value will be correlated with how well the ending is managed. The better the ending, the more it will be remembered as valuable and the gains sustainable. But as a good ending does not mean that all loose ends have been tied up and that the problems of life have been solved. Life is never complete. The fourth one I call living with embodiment. Existentialists dispute the traditional distinction between the mind and the body, preparing the term embodiment. We perceive the world from and in terms of the body. The person is not mind or body, the person is mind and body together. They are functionally inseparable. While in one way we know this in everyday phrases, like when, when we describe someone we do not get on with as a pain in the neck, or after a personal disappointment, we say we are gutted. In another way, language conspires against it with the ease that we can distinguish between my mind and my body, with the body being in some way mistrusted and other, and of emotions being as being disruptive of our equilibrium. In this way, we are not at home in our body. And this distinction is embedded in the way illnesses are thought of, with some, which some, with some being described as psychosomatic. Whether or not the condition has an identifiable biological cause, it always has a dramatic existential impact that has to be acknowledged. In this way, our sense of being embodied is the foundation of our entire existence. Our emotions are the way we feel in our body. They are embodied in sensations that tell us how we are meeting our current dilemmas, if we are prepared to listen. 
When we feel objects in the world, we feel them with our body. When we act on the world, we act on it with our body. Emotions are like the weather, and there's never no weather. We are always feeling something. Prior to the acquisition of language, a child's being will be entirely embodied, and because of the child's immersion and absorption in a particular social setting, as the child's facility with language increases, some experiences will get translated into a verbal language, but it is inevitable that some will not, but all will be embodied. Having said that, some aspects of experiences are so profound, so ineffable, that they probably cannot ever be put into words, except in poetry. But also, that it is these experiences that we need to tune into in order that we may discover our potential. Many adults have forgotten the ambiguous language of play and only value the linearity of verbal language. This can be seen in the way play is judged to be frivolous or not as valuable as more structured activities. But play is anything but frivolous. It is the way we exercise our natural freedom and discover for ourselves the mysteries of the world and our place in it. What is discovered through play can never be learnt from books. Play is central to human development and to achieving our potential. Samanda Beauvoir's work has allowed us to understand not just the distinction between sex, sexuality and gender, but also how these embodied distinctions come about and what they mean throughout the life cycle. Being impressionable and searching for coherence as we grow, as we grow up we absorb and come to embody the meanings of the world we are thrown into and then accept these as normal with all their inconsistencies, tensions and power differentials. In this way, our views about gender and sexuality start to become fixed, embodied from infancy and boys and girls are raised to have a different understanding of their agency and the way they occupy space. Adolescence is when we start to be more aware of our responsibility, temporality and sexuality and is when these tensions usually begin to make themselves felt and we can then choose to either question them in various, question, in various ways or go along with them and enact them. Either way has consequences. But when they become problematic, they can frequently present as genderized physical issues like eating disorders, self-harm, fitness regimes, body dysmorphic disorder, and so on. The desire to be wanted by the other, to be, in a, be seen as sexually desirable, is common to both men and women, and socially constructed inconsistencies, tensions, and power differentials will manifest in different ways throughout the life cycle. The fifth is living with randomness and chance. While randomness and chance are considered to be givens of existence, we can gain a distinctive and valuable insight into their significance when we consider their relationship with trauma and its connection with human development. When trauma is usually talked about, it is not often made clear what it is that is traumatized. The focus is usually on the specific event and is often used as a synonym for very large shock of some sort. While having some truth to it, this is not the whole story. Existentially, trauma is a catastrophic loss of innocence that permanently alters one's sense of being in the world by exposing the, in the universe as random and unpredictable. For a child, such a shock, especially if it's repeated, will be traumatic, and the response may well be the protectionism of narcissism. What is traumatized, then, is our belief in a benign and predictable universe. It is when we find that everything we took to be so is not so. The trust leads to feeling real and alive, with continuity in time and a location in space is shattered. Everyday familiarity collapses and experiences become as if freeze-framed into et an eternal present. We stop becoming existentially born and start existentially dying. We stop developing. Whenever something random happens, whether good or bad, we ask, why me? 
To which the only answer is, no reason, why not you? Unexpected and selfless acts of kindness can have a similar disorientating effect. We habitually defend ourselves with ideas of divine or diabolic intervention, of personal specialness, or good or bad luck, of determinism or narcissism. We can generally take minor reminders of randomness in our stride. Life is, after all, about coming to terms with our insignificance in the grand scheme of things. And many of these events may be salutary and will help us to develop our resilience and sense of perspective. But major or cumulative reminders will shatter our trust in continuity, and when this happens, we become protectively enclosed and separated, not just from everyday life in general, but also from the possibility of an encounter with another person in particular. In trauma, we're open to the, to, opened to the randomness of existence, and in an instant, the world goes from being owned and personally meaningful to being separate and meaningless. We become not just interpersonally alone, but existentially alone. The hyphens in being in the world get removed. Being existential, therefore, means that trauma is not unusual and special. It's ordinary and everyday and can potentially arise out of anything that reminds us that the universe is random and that no continuity of being can be guaranteed. The ordinariness of trauma illuminates the central paradox highlighted by what we can call the absolutisms of everyday life. For example, when we say to a friend, see you tomorrow, we implicitly assume that we will both be alive tomorrow in order to meet. When we add God willing, thereby invoking divine intervention, we acknowledge that whether the meeting takes place will largely be down to factors outside our control. The paradox is that we need the protection of the delusion of, of a benign, predictable universe to carry on with everyday life. Realizing our world is random is so difficult to tolerate that we would rather take responsibility instead. <clears throat> it's somehow more comforting to think that it was in some way our own fault, that somehow we deserved it. But Comfort through taking responsibility for something that was not our responsibility is a dead end. The existential reality is that the event is more than likely not due to deliberate malice, but randomness and human frailty. Trauma can apply just as much to interpersonal events like domestic violence as it can to events that have no rhyme nor reason, like car crashes or life-threatening illnesses. It's bad enough for the event to have happened, but even worse when its effect is not acknowledged by others. This is central, because what defines whether something becomes traumatic or not is not the event as such, but the way its effect is treated by those close to us. Whatever, it's or whatever the origin, trauma becomes a relational event. This, though, offers the, possibility, the potential of recovery from trauma because there's always the possibility of forming bonds of deep emotional attachment with another person within which the emotional pain can be held, rendered more tolerable and eventually integrated. This brings to light another paradox about trauma, that just as trauma is a part of life, then so is recovery from trauma. <clears throat> the next, living with adversity. Happiness is a part of everyone's life's plan, but it's also elusive and we tend to think of it as an absence of anxiety and of having a future free from adversity and struggle. We want it to last. Another problem is that when we try to achieve it technologically with drugs, whether prescribed, recreational or behavioral, or with other shortcuts, it's always at a cost to our humanity. All these options evoke our nostalgia for childhood, and while such anxiety-free moments are valuable and can enable us to reflect, we also know they're transient. Existentially, genuine lasting tranquility can only come with completeness. 
But since we are only complete on death, it's hard to be permanently happy with this option. Happiness is neither a birthright nor something that can be given, taken away, or saved up. As de Beauvoir said, I've always wished for happiness without wishing I had any right to it. I thought of it as being constructed by me, and you had to win your happiness, as I saw it, amid conditions, some of which were burdensome, some favorable. These conditions manifest throughout life as the everyday paradoxes and dilemmas, and is the fact that they are, and it is the fact that they are unsolvable that makes us want to continually explore their possibilities. For Nietzsche, life is struggle, and the paradox is that it is our struggle against adversity, not freedom from adversity, that makes life worth living. Being able to set ourselves successive challenges and meet them on our own terms again and again leads to becoming existentially alive. Happiness, then, is the transient satisfaction that we get from knowing that we have persevered against adversity and succeeded. Ultimately, though, as Kierkegaard said, there is one overarching adversity, that of finding a reason to live and die for. The need to persevere against adversity is universal to all humanity, and whatever we do, the process is always the same. Perseverance is our most transferable skill. We need to acknowledge the context-specific characteristics of the task and work such that there is an optimum amount of anxiety. Too much or too little will hinder learning. This is, as we know, not easy to get right. Perseverance, our ability to learn through making mistakes in our interactions with the world and to continue, is, as I said, our most transferable skill. The worst mistake here is perhaps inaccurate because existentially the only true mistake is one we do not recognize as such and therefore do not learn from. A more accurate word is opportunity. And what makes us alive to opportunity is the gift of despair. We're in despair when we decide that something about our current situation is unsustainable, when our life has lost meaning, because the way we are living is inconsistent with our values. It happens because we close ourselves to the continuity of change, and that while we do not know what to do, we do know that the only way forward is to risk the unknown, and while this was, will involve a sacrifice, and that this will involve sacrifice. Risk in this sense means opening to ambiguity, opening both to our own freedom as well as the randomness of the world. To risk is to embrace with faith the freedom of creating oneself. It's important to note that what is meant by decision is not about selecting between options rather than committing to a course of action. Any change always involves a risk that it could all go horribly wrong. This has to be acknowledged, along with the fact that no one anywhere can give any guarantees either way. Many people try to reduce the risk by trying to control the outcome. But while some planning is possible, control never is. It just shows a lack of faith. The transition to meaning and purpose is completed by realizing that the risk has been worth it that it didn't, after all, go horribly wrong. Such is our fear of change, of temporality, that we find it easy to catastrophize. But actually, although things rarely go horribly wrong, they also rarely go wonderfully right. They usually go unexpectedly different and continue in this way for as long as we stay open to temporality. <coughs> Meaning and purpose is not linked with to any particular sorts of decisions, courses of action, or consequences, so much as the action of taking and owning a decision to face adversity and risk with faith, and with living and owning the consequences of that decision. It's the act of struggle that makes the difference rather than the nature of struggle. And the last one, living with love. Each of us enters and leaves life alone, and in between, we're surrounded by other people. One of the great puzzles of human existence is to work out 
what other people are there for and how to get on with them so that our lives are enhanced rather than diminished. Nevertheless, it is the bonds of love with other people that begin from birth that enable the development of the resilience we need in order to define and carry out our personal projects. The dilemma about love is about its relationship with freedom, that, that, that we wish to separate we, we wish to be separate and distinct at the same time as being connected and known. It's about the realization that people, other people are free to do whatever they want. While this can only ever be solved dialectically, people habitually try to do it either by merging with another, as in falling in love, which inevitably fades or changes into something else, or by trying to keep themselves safe by distancing themselves from other people. The difficulty of maintaining the dialectical both-and solution means that when we feel threatened, we easily degenerate into the either-or. What is rarely understood is that the freedom that leads to fears of separation or suffocation and then to relationships of exploitation is the very same freedom that, that if understood differently, can lead to the experience of knowing that the other person has freely chosen to be with us and to value us not for what we are now, but what we can become in the future. It takes the ability to commit to a future that cannot be planned. Existentially, love cannot be extracted or conditional. It can only be freely given. When we care for someone, what we care for is their autonomy. Judging how much someone can manage at any particular time is difficult and we often get it wrong. The important thing, though, is that we try and we learn from our mistakes. It takes faith to discover the paradoxical freedom of intimacy. We have to trust. Simone de Beauvoir again says, genuine love ought to be founded on the mutual recognition of two liberties. Love would be the revelation of self by the gift of self and the enrichment of the world. But as it is an ideal, it is also compromised by the everyday power differences in society. If there's inequality in society, equality between individuals has to be fought for. For Sartre, love is not an emotion, it's an action. We grow to realize we are loved not by single dramatic declarations or expensive gifts, but individual acts of understanding, not much in themselves, that act like grains of sand that gradually accumulate, in, accumulate into something that can be trusted simply by its persistence over time. It's our freedom that gives us hope. It's often forgotten or not understood that the play which, which is the origin of Sartre's much-quoted Hell is Other People, is set in the afterlife, where people are without freedom. Hell is the condition of being without freedom. He did not say or ever mean that other people are hell. Risky and fascinating, perhaps, but not hell. Another, another paradox of love is that the more you love and are loved, the more sadness you will leave behind because the people you loved and were loved by will miss you. Love brings meaning and happiness, but also sadness and loss. But it is a fulfilled sort of sadness and loss. The sadness and loss that comes from never having loved or having been loved is empty and hollow. Love is the way we treat each other. How we talk to each other, and another way of thinking about it, is in terms of the difference between monologue, duologue, and dialogue. A monologue is where one person is talking and another is listening, and the talker's main concern is to talk with little concern about he or how he or she is received. The listener's experience is, oft, is often one of being talked at rather than being talked to or with. They do not feel included. A duologue is when two people are talking to each other and only superficially listening to each other. They may well take it in turns to talk and listen and even to respond to what each other says, but they're not really hearing each other. They're more likely to be listening to what they want the other to say. Another way to think of this is as two simultaneous monologues. 
A dialogue is when two people are genuinely attending and listening to each other in the spirit of cooperation and trust, rather than competition and defensiveness, not for what they want to hear, but for what is actually being said, and also what is only being hinted at. It involves a mutual openness to the other person and to oneself. A true dialogue will always be characterized by an anxiety of never quite knowing what's going to happen next. It's also important to acknowledge that gaining and losing trust is active rather than passive. Trust will not grow without risk and without being tested. We know that someone is trustworthy when we risk telling them something important and we find it's treated with respect. It creates a sense of future that has possibilities. So, in summary, an existentialist psycholo essentialist psychology is one that is based on a model of human development that relies on the principles of biological and environmental determinism. But the fact that people are different is not due simply to biological variety, nature, or the complexity of environmental influences, nurture, although these are clearly significant. It is because people are free, have choice, and hence are fundamentally unpredictable. It is, it is freedom that allows new things to arise out of old and for problems to be solved dialectically. It is freedom that makes all creativity possible, whether in a formal art sense or an informal living sense. This means that existentially there can be no universal stages of human development and neither can it be linear or unidirectional. This also means that there will never be an existential theory of human development in the way that there is a psychoanalytic or a cognitive or a neuro neurological theory. Just as the most perfect work of art will never be produced by anyone and that no true artist thinks they've made the best work they will ever make, such questions will never be solved. It is in the nature of, it, it is our, our nature to be unfinished projects, and when we stop having projects, we die. And while we can find out many fascinating things, we need to remember that life is a mystery that has no end, and we need to acknowledge that there are limits to our personal knowledge and to our potential. But it is our responsibility to find out for ourselves what these limits are. Yeah. So we've got 10 minutes or so for questions and responses. And as I said, I'm not the only one, I'm not the only person able to answer the questions or, or respond to them.
<clears throat> okay, so it's a quick question about, about spirituality and the place of spirituality in the existential worldview. Um, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but it depends. <laughs> it depends which existentialist you, you go to for an answer. If you go to Sartre, he, uh, he, 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 would, he really hasn't got much time for it at all. He, he's a real full-on atheist. The, the word sp spiritual has <coughs> close to zero meaning for Sartre. If you go to K Kierkegaard, this, it has a great deal of meaning. Having said that, he, he also talks a great deal about, as I've said, the, the importance of the individual f finding, g f finding their own meaning to the world, the, the word spiritual. And he, in, his, in his world, he blamed the Lutheran church for, for hijacking the idea of spirituality. He, he blames he bl bl blames religion for equating spirituality with a religion. As far as he's concerned, spirituality has nothing at all to do with religion. Uh, you won't find spirituality by going to church. You'll probably find it by walking in the country. Um, if you if you look at other existentialists like Martin Buber. You, uh, you get a, a very strong sense of the, the spiritual there. Um, if we th think, I guess, if we th think of the spiritual as, in general as being a sense of a connectedness to something other than just me here, then I, th I think this is probably shared in one way or another by all existentialists. And if Sartre were here, I'm, well, I don't think I'd be able to persuade him of anything, but I, 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 I think he might actually go along with so, a little bit of that. He did have quite a lot of time for Kierkegaard, actually, although they departed on, on this particular thing. So it depends exactly how you define spirituality. Spirituality as a, a given thing that is here, prior to us and independently of us, no, that's, that, that, that's out. But as, a, as a, a human construction, not just made by me because of my thinking, but because of the way the entire human race operates, yes. You know, because we do, we, we are a, a, single, a single operation, as we can see by... You know, Ecological change. We, you know, we, 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 make, we all make a difference as a as a whole. We are connected. If you want to call that spirituality, that's fine. I think I probably would. Thank you very much. I I wonder if you could speak about I guess the difference around and what does intersect politically because then why do we avoid making the talk? Right, it's about the, the, the relationship of existential thought to the wider world, to, to politics. Um, the, 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 this was something that both Sartre, Merleau-Ponty and Simone de Beauvoir said a great deal about. They, uh, they essentially saw that there was no difference between the two, and hence the, you know, the phrase, the personal it is political. What they would say would... Uh, so, 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 Sartre, to take, take an interview, he, he, he took quite a, a political view with a capital B. So Mont de Beauvoir took more of a social, small, small political, small p view. Uh, uh, but uh, they both, they both, e both emphasised the, the necessity of, of challenging the status quo because they, 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 
they knew and they, that, that, that they, that they experienced, as I said, so de Beauvoir became intent, intensely aware of her freedom because of her lack of it, and intensely aware of the need, need to question the st status quo and to, and to continually doubt and try to, to doubt what we're being told and to, you know, I'm gonna use this phrase, to take back control. Individuals need to take back control. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't expect somebody else to take it back for us. So it all comes down, you know, it, it, it comes down to a personal individual action it comes down to everyone's personal individual actions make, making a difference to the whole. Um, I've had arguments with other existentialists about this, but in a very simple example, a personal view of mine would, would be that, that not voting is not an option. Not voting in elections is not an option. The, the power imbalances, the dictators and so on, only get their power from people who don't say, that's enough. They, they get their power when people don't vote. So the, 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 the individual act of, of, of voting is, a, in a sense, it's an existential act. I'm making, might not make, make a massive amount of difference. I'm one vote in 20 million, but at least I, I said what I thought, and perhaps going out on the street as well will make, it might not make a massive difference, but it makes a di difference to me because I feel more connected to the, the society that I am actually a part of, and the society that made me the person I am. And it's these, this, this demand almost that people like Sartre and Merleau-Ponty and, and someone the Beauvoir in the political arena and Nietzsche in a, a, a less overtly political arena would be, would be a, kind of almost an exist, existential expectation that ex, in, order to, in order to be fully ourselves, we need to ask, hang on, what's going on? And are, are these people actually doing things in my name or are they doing them in their own name and taking my name and using it. Thank you very much, Martin. Oh, for that. Really well, thank you. Fantastic.